So thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for coming to, the, uh, to this class. Uh, I really appreciate um, your presence here. Uh, I, since the beginning of my career as a photographer, I've always uh, printed. I've been doing this for uh, eight or nine years now. And um, the print was always something that I wanted to make. I've said this in other classes, but I think it's important, especially given what this class is about. Uh, because to me, it just uh, it represents the finished piece of uh, a vision. You know, you're out in the field, you're taking pictures of nature or portraits or people or whatever it is that you like to photograph. And for me, the print was kind of something that I could uh, show to others without any kind of interpretation in terms of a monitor or a screen or anything like that. Plus, it has this enduring quality to it that I really like. Uh, if anyone's been printing for eight or nine years, printing has changed a lot in, in this period. Not only the printers and the papers, but also the software. And one of the difficulties with printing before Lightroom was that it was rather complicated. It could be uh, a, 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 la you know, a field uh, day of landmines and all kinds of other things that could get you and, if, and you weren't sure what went wrong, whether it was the paper, whether your profile was off, whether your processing was off, whether your monitor, who knows what it was. There were so many things that you had to check and double check. I used to have this long checklist of things that I would go through whenever I made a print to make sure uh, that I got the print right, whether it was the print driver for Epson or Photoshop, color settings, all kinds of stuff. And if, if there's anything, if there's a way to be passionate or it's, if it's possible to be passionate about software, uh, I definitely am about Lightroom for many reasons. Uh, and part of it comes from, stems from that pain that I experienced for so long. And along came Lightroom, which was Adobe's sort of answer to, all, to, to the pain that all photographers were having, not just in printing, but in developing and managing, cataloging, the whole thing. Uh, and if there's one aspect of Lightroom that I think is strongest, uh, is, it's the print module. And it's not just because the print module is included, but I actually think that it's one of the strongest features of Lightroom. So even if, for example, I wasn't developing my images in, in Lightroom, I was using some other piece of software like Capture One or Aperture or whatever, I would probably still import those images into Lightroom just for the, the printing functionality. If you like to print, if you like to make lots of prints, you'll appreciate what I'm saying. Um, so some of the advantages of printing in Lightroom, and again, this might be uh, old news to some of you, but I just want to just cover the basics so that we're all starting on the same page. Uh, you know, first of all, you're printing f uh, from your RAW files. And if you're importing RAW files, it means that you have 16-bit um, images that are in a, the largest color space possible, pro, you know, a pro photo-like uh, color space. Um, so you're printing right from those files versus going to an intermediary format like a Photoshop or a TIFF file or a JPEG. Uh, you know, that, so that's one really nice thing. In terms of workflow, it keeps you in one interface, it keeps you in one application, and it just allows you smoothly to go from import to develop to printing, if that's what you want to do. Uh, the second thing is the layout feature. Uh, the layout feature in Lightroom used to be something that we'd have to buy an expensive RIP for. Anybody ever used a RIP in the past? It was sort of similar to what the print module is in Lightroom. It allowed you to lay out pictures, multiple pictures on a sheet of paper, organize them. That was really difficult to do in Photoshop. You would have to expand your canvas and bring import, and it was just difficult to manage. And even if you did it in Photoshop and you laid a couple of pictures out, it was really just it only worked for that specific application. You couldn't, you know, use that again in the future. In Lightroom, you can uh, save templates, and templates is one of like the greatest things. I mean, I, I, I get up every day and I'm thankful for templates. Why? Because, <laughs> I, because, because when I have to go down to my studio to make a print, I know that I can run these templates that I invested the time to make and now I can get it knocked out pretty quickly and not worry about whether, for instance, my profile is off or whether I've chosen the right sharpening, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there, is a, there is a company called Pixel Genius, uh, who, which is owned by a couple of well-known Adobe gurus like Jeff Shiwi and Martin Evening and people like that. And they have a plugin called, well, I have several plugins, but one of them that I used to use all the time in Photoshop is called uh, uh, PhotoKit Sharpener, which was a great plugin that analyzed, in Photoshop, analyzed your image based on the size, the resolution, et cetera, and then applied a sharpening that they thought would be optimal. And that was uh, based on a guy named Bruce Frazier who passed away, who was sort of like the guru of sharpening. That plugin. Uh, is incorporated into Lightroom. I believe as of Lightroom 3, definitely as of Lightroom 4 and 5. So when you do print sharpening in Lightroom, you're actually using a plugin that would cost you 100 bucks or so, uh, more or less around that amount to get that functionality in Photoshop. So it's not just 
you know, a, a basic plugin. It's, it's a really good one. Uh, and so it will analyze the picture and apply the sharpening based on the resolution and the, the amount of information that you have in that, in that file. So that's also really nice. Um, another advantage to Lightroom in terms of printing is the soft proofing feature, which was added in Lightroom 4. Uh, and that was also something that you would have to do in Photoshop. And what soft proofing is, and I will demonstrate and show you how it works, is it allows you to apply um, a paper profile to an image to see how the image changes based on that paper, based on the limitations of the paper that you're going to print on. And if it does or doesn't match your original, you can make changes to the, uh, to the print version of that image. So if you need more contrast or you notice that it loses uh, a color in a certain area, or let's say it has out of gamut colors, meaning out of gamut means that there are some colors that uh, the paper won't be able to reproduce from your original, you can adjust that if you need to. So soft proofing is really nice. It's not perfect. Nothing is going to be as perfect as an actual hard copy. That's going to be your, your ultimate uh, proof. So printing something out and seeing what it looks like is going to be the best way to tell. But the soft proofing gets us a lot closer, especially when it comes to things like um, color changes. If you know, a particular hue of red changes very much, you can adjust that and not get surprised when you make the print. Um, what else? Also, you know, just a lot of versatility in terms of being able to lay out multiple images, being able to do contact sheets, being able to uh, make triptychs, and I'll show you how to do that. A triptych not, with, well you can make it with three, I can, I'm also going to show you how to make it with one. So you can actually take one image and break it up into three pieces and then lay that on a piece of paper so that you can decide which parts of that image you want to show in each of the three panels, for example. Okay. Um, you can bring in borders, you can, do, you can apply borders within Lightroom, you can also bring in uh, Photoshop borders, like really fancy, nice filmic borders that you can get uh, online, lots of places for free. If you do a search for photo borders in Google Images, you'll get a ton of uh, uh, files that you can actually use to make fancy borders in Lightroom. So I've also used the print module to make layouts for my website, for example. If I want uh, a specific layout on my website, in addition to being able to print a layout, you can also save it as a JPEG. So you don't have to print it. You can have Lightroom export a JPEG version of that layout that you've created, and then you can use that JPEG wherever you want. So if I want something really nice for my home page or a blog post or whatever, and I'm laying out a couple of images, I can do that in Lightroom. And that's much, much easier and faster to do than doing it in Photoshop. And let's say something you want to do repeatedly, you save that as a template, and then it makes it a piece of cake uh, in the future when you want to do it. So, so let's go through some of the, the basics of the print module, right? So I'm assuming first that, well, actually, before we get to the print module, let's, let's do the soft proofing. The reason for that is because the soft proofing is actually part of the develop module. Now, you might think, well, why didn't they put it in the print module? I think probably the reason is because uh, when you're doing soft proofing, the, the idea is to make changes to your image uh, in the develop module, meaning you may adjust contrast or things like that. And so that's still technically a part of the developing. So let's say I want to make a print of um, this image here. I'm going to switch to a catalog here that I created called uh, Katy National Park. OK. So if I take this into the develop module, let's assume now that I've already developed this image where I want it to be. I've gotten it looking the way I want. These are uh, JPEG images that I'm working on. Let's assume that they're raw. I just have them as JPEGs for sake of the presentation. And also, they're smaller files, so I don't have to worry about my computer slowing down too much. But for practical purposes, let's say it's a raw file. Um, the soft proofing module, which you can initiate by pressing the S key, OK, that puts you into the soft proofing mode. And you see it brings up this white border in the back. OK, so that kind of simulates paper, right? Uh, one other thing I'm going to mention is that as I open and close these panels here, you notice that one will open and the other will close. And that's because I like to keep my panels in what's called solo mode. Mm -hmm. So if you control click or right click on these little triangles here, there's an option to put them into solo mode. If you take them out of solo mode, it means that you can have multiple panels open at the same time. And some people like this because they can kind of go through all their panels. I prefer to have just one open. It just kind of keeps things a little simpler. So that's called solo mode. And this works in all areas of Lightroom, not just the develop or the print module. All right, so once we're in the soft proofing module, you notice that over here on the right, in the right panel, we have a window here that allows us to set our profile, OK? And it allows us to set our rendering intent, OK? 
Now, in profile here, I only have two profiles shown here because those are the only two that I probably have checked. So in order to bring in other paper profiles, I'm going to click on other, and we'll have some other profiles here, right? Now, I, it would only show profiles that I have with a printer connected. I don't have any printers connected, so I'm just going to choose one of these profiles here. It doesn't really matter for sake of argument which one I use. Now, when I do that, you see I've chosen this profile here called Brother for a Brother printer. It could be for an Epson printer. It could be for a Canon, what have you. You notice that the image changes markedly, okay? And so this is giving you an idea of what the image is going to look like. This is out of soft proofing, and this is with the soft proofing. Now, if you want a comparison, which is how I like to work so that you have the original on one side and the soft proof version on the other, you can hit the Y key for compare. Okay, so here's what the original image looks like, and then this is what the soft proof version. And this, this means that Lightroom is basically saying that this is the way it's going to look when it's printed. Now, on that keep particular paper. On that particular paper, exactly. So this will change for every single paper that you use, uh, which is why, for example, if you're uh, trying different papers out, make sure that you go ahead and download the right profile from the paper manufacturer. So for instance, whoever takes a sample pack today of cans on paper, make sure you go on their website, download a profile for the paper that you want to print on for your specific printer. When you add that profile to Lightroom, it will then show up here and you'll be able to see more or less how the print will look on that specific paper. How do you do that? How do you download it to get it and then get it in? When you download it, from Canson, there will be a little file attached with the download and it explains exactly where to put it because it's different for Windows or Mac. So there's different locations, but it's pretty self-explanatory. They even give you a whole diagram on their website where to put it. So it's pretty straightforward. But the m important thing is that that profile, even after you install it in the proper folder on your computer, it will not show up here unless you enable it in Lightroom. And I love this feature because anyone who has done a lot of printing knows that in Photoshop, you'll get this giant list of scrolling profiles. So here, this allows you to just show the profiles that you actually want to use. So what I did was, again, right here in the profile, uh, drop down, it only shows you which ones I want to see based on what I have checked. And if I want to show others, I select other here, I get this window. And on my home computer where I do most of my printing, this is a huge, huge list. And then the ones that I want to show or have available to me in Lightroom have a little checkbox next to it. All right, so that just kind of helps to keep things tidy and easier to, uh, to use. And it also eliminates the chances of you selecting the wrong profile by accident because it's only going to show you the profiles that you actually want to work with. And I've chosen the wrong profile because the names can be cryptic and confusing and oh, I, I really wanted this one, not that one. And the letters are all the same, that kind of thing. Okay, so now once you have the soft proof enabled like I do now and you can see the changes, then we can go about making adjustments here. Now, it also allows you to change the rendering intent. And the rendering intent is basically a way in which Lightroom is going to uh, reduce the amount of colors from your original RAW file on the left to the profile on the right. Because in general, printers don't have the same color gamut, the same color capability as your original file. So the colors have to be reduced to fit within gamut. And gamut is basically a term that means the size of the colors that we can print with. Like Think of it like a crayon box or a balloon, that kind of thing. The bigger your balloon, the bigger your color gamut. And every paper has a different size and different type of color gamut. So that's why you see the color change. Now, the rendering intent sets how those colors are going to be reduced. There are two different methods. I'm not going to get into specifically how they actually do it. But the way to use them is really visually. So you notice here that we have perceptual and relative. And I just you can select one or the other. And as you select one or the other, you may or may not see changes in the proofed version on the right. And if you do see changes, then you want to select the rendering intent that gives you the one that looks closest to your original. OK, that's as simple, as simple as that. There isn't any math or formula or anything like that. It all depends on the image. It depends on the subject. It depends on the colors that you have. It depends on how you've processed the image, et cetera. So I just do a visual check to see. To my eye, on this particular image, I'm not seeing much change at all between relative and perceptual. Now, Interestingly enough, there is another profile here that we can choose called sRGB. And the reason why the sRGB is interesting is because this is the color space of the internet. So everything online uses sRGB. And you can see here um, how your image will change from your original RAW file to 
an sRGB profile if you're putting it online. And again, uh, between relative and perceptual, I'm not picking up too many differences. So again, it depends on the image. Sometimes there are, sometimes there aren't. I'm going to leave it on perceptual. If there, isn't, if there aren't any differences, then perceptual tends to be the one that people uh, use. And I think it's probably m more often you're going to use perceptual because it just looks closer. All right. Now, in this case, going back to the brother you see, I lose some contrast. So I can come down here to the tone curve and try to add some of that contrast in. Now, as soon as I try to make an adjustment, which I just did, okay, I try to adjust my S curve here, Lightroom will give you this little dialog that says, uh, create a virtual copy for soft proofing. And this is another one of the great features of Lightroom. Because if I say yes, create proof copy, what Lightroom has done now is created a virtual copy, like a regular virtual copy that we can normally do in Lightroom. Um, it's created a, a, a virtual copy of that original image, and that virtual copy will hold our adjustments for this specific profile that we're printing with, okay, with, for, for this paper, essentially. So I can have three or four different soft proof copies of an original image, and each one of those soft proof copies might be tailored towards a specific type of paper. And it stores it that way in the library module. So when I come back to make that print, I just select that soft proof copy and it names it with the profile. So you notice up here, you see the name of this proof uh, virtual copy, it's Boulder Beach, which is the original name, plus it's added brother, plain paper, normal on the end. And that's the profile that I'm using. So this way when I go to make prints, and I know that I've made a print before that worked really well in this paper. All I got to do is use that paper again and use that profile. And the adjustments that I'm going to make now get preserved with that virtual copy. All right. So again, if I now add a little contrast here to this image to try to bring it back the way it looked originally and maybe adjust um, the temperature here. Okay, and let's say um, add a little more clarity. Now, some of these adjustments that I'm making are going to be typically what you, what you might want to do when you're making prints in, prints in general. So in general, you're going to lose a little bit of contrast, especially when you go to a matte type paper. So usually I add a little bit more contrast or I add some contrast to my proof copy. And I'll also add maybe a little bit of clarity. And the clarity, again, clarity is local contrast in Lightroom. And that just helps to make the print look a little bit more defined, have a little bit more definition to it. Remember that we're going to, when we're going from our monitor to paper, okay, that's a totally different medium. We're going to lose in some areas. And so this is something that I typically do. I typically add a little bit of clarity and a little bit of contrast. And then depending on how it looks to the original, I may have to adjust individual colors. All right, so once, that's basically the soft proofing uh, feature in, in Lightroom. And uh, I would say 90% of the time, I think it helps me to, and it, and it will help you, to get a little bit closer to the final result on paper. Okay, so once, once we have the, pro, uh, the proof, you know, looking the way we want, then we can go into the, into the print module. So a shortcut for that is Command or Control P, all right, and that'll take us right into the print module, uh, or you can just click the, click, click the uh, print module, uh, print button up here. Uh, and I, I like to use keyboard shortcuts because it just kind of speeds things up a little bit. So when I'm in the print module, the first thing I do when I go in is I set my paper size. Okay, so we know what kind of paper we're working with. Working with. And right here along the bottom, we have uh, a couple of buttons. A big one right here is page setup. All right, click on that, and we have a dialog to set the paper size. First, you would set your printer. Okay, I'm gonna leave it set to any printer, but if you were printing on your Epson or your Canon or your brother, whatever, you would choose your printer here. And then below that, you would choose your paper size. Okay, and I have it set to US letter. And also one thing to note is that you can also make custom paper sizes. And that's gonna be limited by your specific printer, but you can. So for instance, um, I have one here called eight and a half by 11, no borders. And the reason for that is because let's say, as I mentioned before, I wanted to make a layout that I was gonna export as a JPEG and not print, I want a layout that doesn't have any border so I can go all the way to the edge because I have that flexibility. The way to do that is you just go into manage custom sizes here and then you can set uh, the paper size and you can set the margins. So if I, for example, this one is eight and a half by 11, that's what I have the, height, the width and the height set to and then I have the margin set to zero and that creates a piece of paper that has no margins. 
when you're going on a printer, when you're printing to a printer, the printer is going to limit you to certain margins based on the printer. So Epson has certain um, limitations. Canon has certain limitations. On the Epson, there is a way to go into the um, uh, full full screen print, uh, whatever's uh, whatever's uh, bleed or you know uh, full screen on the paper so that you can print without any borders. And that would be the paper size that you have to s select that specific paper type so that you can print without any borders on the paper. But in general, you're going to have a little border on your, on, your, uh, on your paper. So I'm going to set this to US letter, and that's going to give me these borders. And that's what you see in these gray outlines all around. All right, so we can't print beyond that. <coughs> Next thing I usually do before I start laying it out is check my print settings. All right, and the print settings is going to allow me to set how the printer, the, it's going to allow me to set the print driver. Now, because I don't have an Epson or a Canon on your printer connected to this computer, I can't, act, I can't actually show you that dialog, but I did grab a screenshot of it. So if I, um, let's see where that is here. Um, print dialogs, okay. So when you set, when you click on, uh, printer setup, you'll get this dialog. And this is set here for an Epson 3880, okay? And then in the printer settings, these are the settings that you want to make sure you use. So for example, in media type, you want to set the proper media type for the paper that you're using. And that media type is also going to be given to you by the paper manufacturer. So when you go to Canson or Epson, well, Epson, they'll have the media types already because Epson provides their own papers. But if you're using a third-party paper like Hanamule or Canson, what have you, Cancel will say, for this paper, use this profile and use this media type on an Epson printer. On a Canon printer, they'll say, use this media type on a Canon printer. So for instance, to print on uh, one of the papers that I like from Canson, this is the media type that they recommend. And then you want to make sure that the color mode is set to off. And this is because we're going to let Lightroom determine the color settings, not the printer. So this is saying, we don't want the printer to set the color. We want Lightroom to set the color based on the profile. So this has to be off. Superphoto, this is just a resolution setting for the printer. I usually like to print as high as I can go. So this is set to 2880 on the Epson. And then high speed I check because that means that the printer will print when it's printing in both directions. And it just kind of speeds things up without any loss in quality as far as I've seen. And 16-bit output, if you're on a Mac, you can check that. And that means that if you're printing from raw files, you can print 16-bit files. Okay, so that's, the, that's going to be the Epson dialog. Most important thing here, of course, is to make sure you have the media set properly and you have the color mode set to off, no color management. Those two things are critical. Uh, if you don't have the color management set to off, then you're going to override the profile from the paper and the printer is going to try to choose its own color. You're not going to get an accurate print. And same thing with the media type. Okay, so let's go back to Acadia here. Now, once we have that set, you notice down here my film strip, okay? In the print module, we're able to choose uh, different collections that we, want, that we can print from. In other words, you can actually go into a collection that you've created beforehand and use select from those images. So I have several collections here that I've made, okay? Uh, and one of them is called Acadia, and here's our proof setup, our proof uh, of virtual copy, because you can see it has a little flap here on the left-hand side. So this is the one that I want to print from, not my original, because my original is not, it's, it's the original, it's not the proof copy that has the adjustments made to it. All right, so now once I have that laid out in here, okay, then once I can go ahead and choose several things. We have margins. Right, left and right. So I'm going to set all these margins to zero. I had an original. I had a uh, had it set up a certain way, but I'm going to try to zero it out and start over again. We can set our margins here, all right, and then we can also set our cell size. Those are the two basic things: our margins and our cell uh, our cell size. And the cell size the cell size defines the area that you can print within. So whatever the cell size is, that's what you're going to print inside of, and it depends on whether the picture fits perfectly in that cell size or not. So for instance, in this example, I have a cell size of, I'm moving the cell size around. And as I move all these controls, they're all pretty, they're all, they're all very, um, uh, they, work, they all work together. So it kind of gives you sort of like a, 
what you see is what you get kind of interface. And you can drag with these sliders, or you can actually put your mouse right in here and drag in here as well. Now you can see as I move the cell size around, it changes the cell size, but it isn't cropping my image. So it's basically going to fit the image within that cell. Now, if I wanted to have Lightroom automatically crop the image for me so that as I move the cell, it constrains the image within that cell, there's a checkbox up here in image settings called zoom to fill. And if I click on that, then you can see that it expands the image to fit within the cell size, of course, cropping some of the image. But this is useful, as, useful if you need to make a specific size print. So for instance, I'm going to set my height to 5 and my width to 7. So let's say I have to make it 5 by 7 for whatever reason, and the, my original image doesn't fit that aspect ratio. This is a way to achieve that as long as I have the zoom to fill turned on. If I turn it off, you see I got a little white space on top and bottom. If I turn it on, then it zooms it in, and as I drag over the image, it turns into a little hand, and I can drag and choose what part of the image I want to be in the, my, my print cell size. Okay, so that's, that's really handy for being able to make prints that you need to fit within a certain size and, and your original crop doesn't fit or your aspect ratio, et cetera. So that's really handy. And again, when we do this, we're not changing the original file in any way. We're not, you know, we're not doing anything that's destructive or saving it in any way. This is just specifically for this particular print. When we go back to the library module, all the images have their full size, whatever we've saved originally in terms of our crop. So very, very useful, very, very handy. Okay. Now, right above the image settings, uh, I started in the single image, and that's usually where you're going to start. I just wanted to, to uh, highlight this very quickly. The top panel here called layout style, single image is, the, is probably more, the more common one, meaning that when we're in single image, we're going to print one image. Now, we also have an option of doing picture package or custom package. Just make sure you're in single image when you just want to print one image on a piece of paper. We'll cover the others uh, a little bit later. All right, so I'm going to turn off the zoom to fill for now. The rotate to fit, which is checked, what that does is, you might have noticed before, as I adjusted the cell size, it actually rotated the image to fit within the cell uh, a little bit better. So in other words, if our cell happens to be uh, higher than it is wider, then it will rotate the image automatically for us. If you don't want that, of course, you just turn that off, and it will keep it always in the orientation that you want. Uh, I use this sometimes when I'm printing uh, two images, and I'll show you how, how that would how I would do that in a, in, a, in a minute. Now, once we set up, so I'm gonna go, let's go back to my cell size here. I'm going to type in 9, and I'm going to type in uh, 6, right? The borders basically allow us to move the image around if we want to. So for example, I typically like to leave a little bit of room, uh, more space on the bottom of the image versus the top. So I can use the bottom. Uh, border here to move the image up or down. Okay, so you can see I can move this up just a little bit, and that allows me to take the image off center and put a little more space on the bottom. So that's, you know, kind of a nice thing that you can do there uh, with the with the border. You can also do it with the top border if you want to push it down, etc. Now notice that once I start pushing where I can't go further, then it will start to shrink the cell size down. So just be very careful of that. But as long as you're not going past your margin at the top or the bottom, then it will move the image around and keep your cell size. So I'm going to set it to about there. Okay, that's, uh, and you can also type in here. So I'm going to type in 0.75 for 3 quarters of an inch. Um, we also have the next panel down. I'm going to skip a few here because the others have to do with multiple images on a page. So I, I want to get through at least one single image, and then we'll go back and look at multiple images and fancier type layouts. Below here we have uh, guides, and this basically gives us visual guides. They do not print. But these are visual guides that show us our borders and our cell size. And another very important one here that's unchecked is dimensions. And this is very good because it shows us the dimensions that the, of the actual print. Not the paper, but the print itself. So you see that it's telling us here 8.9 by 6 inches. That gives us a good idea of, uh, tells us what size we're going to print that. And also, uh, in the, I'm going to jump to this in a minute, print resolution. I'm going to just uncheck it for now. It also tells us our print resolution, or how much resolution we have from this image to print at this size. Now, you only get that when down here you have the print resolution unchecked. And I'm going to talk about this panel 
in detail in a minute. So just wanted to turn that off so you could see that print resolution setting. And this is very useful to see how much resolution we have at that size, determine whether we need to upsample or whether we can even make the print at that size. Okay, now below the guides we have uh, the page panel and these items here all will print. So they will actually print on your paper. So for example, we can now change, you can change the background of the print. In other words, you can change the paper of the color, uh, the color of the paper. And right now it's set to white, so you don't see any difference. But if I choose here a gray, all right, this will actually print that background. And I don't think I've ever done this, but you can if you want to. Not for printing, but it's very useful if you want to export as a JPEG or as a PDF, which we can do, like I mentioned before. Uh, if you wanted to print this way, you can. It's going to waste a hell of a lot of ink. <laughs> but, um, but, that, but that's an option. Okay, so you can't change the page background. Uh, the other thing is when you turn this on, one nice thing is that we also have borders uh, that are up here. And you can insert a border. Okay, I'm gonna turn I'm gonna turn the guides off so just so that we can see without the guides because the guides sometimes get in the way. We can add a border, all right, and that's a border with the page background. And if I turn the page background off, which would probably be the more common way you're gonna print, then that's just a border. And we have adjustments of the width of the border, so I can go as high as 20 uh, points, as low as 0.2 points, which is kind of a hairline, and then we can adjust the color by clicking on this little color chip right here. So if I click on that, I can choose a gray border, dark gray, or black. Okay, and you can also uh, choose any number of colors here. We can make the borders any color that we want. So we can choose, let's say, a bluish color, and we can increase the width, and then you would have that kind of effect. So if you want to add any type of borders, that's a, that's a really nice feature. I tend to, I've only used the black. I've, I've used black in the past for some special purposes, other than that, this would be better for exporting as some kind of a JPEG file if you wanted to export this, but um, that's, that's what it's there for, you know, use your imagination and your creativity. Okay, so that's the board. I'm going to turn the guides back on so that we can see our guides. Um, one of the mo more powerful features of the print module in Lightroom is the, what's called the identity plate. And the identity plate is either text or a graphic that you can import into Lightroom, and then you can use that graphic to place anywhere on your print. So you turn the identity plate on here. I'm going to turn that on. OK. And then this shows you the plate itself. Right now, I actually have a graphic, which, hap which happens to be my signature. So this is a signature file. I, uh, I guess I signed my name, and I scanned it, and I brought that into Photoshop. OK, and then once you bring it into Photoshop, then you can import that graphic into Lightroom. And the way you do that is if I click here, anywhere in this, in this window here, you'll get this little drop down that allows you to choose whatever identity place you've saved. And I, I've saved a bunch here. But if you wanted to make a new one, you hit Edit. And you get this dialog, Identity Plate Editor. And if you wanted to import your own graphic, OK, you have a choice of using text. OK, there's some text here that you can barely see, or I guess I can type some things in there. Or you can use a graphic. And if I choose graphic, then you can say locate file. OK, and it'll take you to a window where you can actually import a graphic. So here I have a bunch of different graphics, uh, some things that I've, uh, some logos of mine that I've used. Here's one here. If I hit choose, right, now you can see that that graphic is imported. And I can now also save that graphic and give it a name so that I can reuse it again in the future. So right here in this drop down, I can say save as, and I'm going to call this logo 4. Hit save, and then hit enter, or OK. And now I have this graphic here that I can actually drag around. And we also have the option of changing the opacity and the size. Let me make it a little bigger so we can see it easier here. All right. The size is going to depend on how big you make the file originally when you created in Photoshop or what have you. So if you want to be able to make this graphic pretty big, make sure that you give it enough resolution. So I usually do like, um, you know, I, I'll make a graphic that's, let's say, 300 DPI, 4 inches wide. And then I'll put my logo, my graphic, or whatever in there. And that generally is enough for any kind of print I'm going to make. Even if I make a pretty large print, my logo is never going to be more than, let's say, 4 inches wide. 
okay? And if you need bigger, you can always just make a special one to make it bigger. But the nice thing about this is that I can now put this anywhere I want in the image. It, it sits over the print if I want it to, to, okay? I can change the scale. I can change the opacity and fade it out. I can also rotate it. So right here next to identity plate, there's this little hidden zero. <laughs> and if I click on that, I can rotate it in any orientation that I want. And this is useful if you're printing uh, an image that you want the graphic to be, let's say, on the bottom or on the top or what have you. So, you know, you have lots and lots of choices there. Notice I also have other logos. So, for instance, uh, I also have some, well, I have logos. I also have text. If I choose this, this is just some basic text with my name. And you can set uh, the text in the uh, identity plate dialog that I showed you before. You can just type some text in there. You can choose the font of your liking and the size. Nice thing about the text is that you can also change the color here. So for instance, I originally made this text to be white. So if I, let's make it big here, you can see it. Bring it down here so you can see it there. So if you wanted to put this over your image, white works pretty well. But let's say you want to put it on the paper, white's not going to work too well. So you have the option here of overriding the original color. And I'm going to click this box here and now it changes to black. Or you can click on this little chip and you can choose whatever color you want. So I can make it gray or any, uh, any RGB color that I want. Okay, so that's very nice. And if you get, if you get creative, uh, you can use that identity plate for lots of different things. For instance, I've used it um, in making special prints that I wanted, the name and also the title of the piece that I was making and let's say some information that's specific for that print. And so I took the time to make that in Photoshop because I was gonna make 10 or 12 or 15 prints with that logo on there. And I may not be using it much more after that, but I was able to do it for that one job. And the nice thing about doing it here versus, let's say, laying out in Photoshop is that here I can move it around, I can change it, I can uh, place it different places. So I have a lot of options there and see how it looks when I print it. So for instance, if anybody can see this, here's a print that I make and my logo is right here on the bottom left. And that same, that's how I created that logo uh, right in Lightroom. Okay, and it makes it very easy to do that. Okay, what else can we put on the print here? Um, we also have a, a watermark. Okay, you can apply watermark. And a watermark is gonna be similar to the watermark that you use on your regular, uh, uh, in the, in when you're exporting, for example. So if I turn this on, it says none. That's because it just set to none, but I do have one called with my name here, and it puts a little watermark down here with a copyright symbol. So again, just another option, not as versatile as the identity plate because the watermark can only be text. It can't be, uh, it's not, you can't move it around and have the flexibility that you have with the identity plate, but it's still there. I think the watermark works really well, for, really well for making contact sheets. So if you're making a contact sheet, and I'll show you how to do that, you can put the little watermark on your, uh, on, because the watermark will show on every single image versus the identity plate only shows once. And that's another key difference. The watermark will be on every single image if you have a contact sheet. And again, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you that so you see exactly what that looks like. Um, you also can print uh, information about the photo itself, and that shows up as a little text down here. And you can grab that from any of the metadata in the image. Uh, I have a, a, a habit of the prints that I print normally. I put the title of the print in the title field in the metadata. Okay, so for instance, I'm just gonna to jump to the library module very quickly. On this image here in the metadata, I put the title right in here in the title field all right, of that image. And the reason why I do that is because, A, you can use that title field when you export the image to rename the file with the title, and B, when you're printing, you have access to that right here in the photo info that you can print. So I can go here and say title, and it grabs that title. Now you have to do the work beforehand, which means you have to you know, type in the title for every image, but you do it once. And once you do it, then every time you make that print from now till whenever, you have access to that information if you need it. But this can also be, for instance, uh, the exposure setting, or it could be uh, you know, the date or what have you. So that's useful, again, if you're making proofs. Sometimes when I make a proof, I'll put that information there, or if I'm doing a contact sheet, I can put the name of the file so that someone can choose the file, et cetera. So again, lots of different uses, uses for it. You cannot move it around, so it is limited. You can't take it and move it down here to the bottom left or the bottom right. It's always gonna be on the bottom of the image centered, so you are limited in that case. 
And it makes the image a little smaller, that's correct. So because it pushes it into the cell size, it'll make your image a, a tiny bit smaller. Um, so you see here it's inside the cell, not outside the cell. So you, you can compensate for that, or you can make your cell size a little bit bigger, et cetera. Uh, the nice thing is that, again, when we, sh when we talk about saving the templates, and I'm going to do that in a minute, once you save something that you spend a little time working on, then you can reuse it over and over and over again. Okay. Hold the, hold the question for a minute, please. Thank you. Um, okay, so you can also change the font size as well with the, uh, with the photo info. Now the last panel, which is probably the most important one, right, is the, the print job itself. How are we going to print the image? How, what color uh, it's, uh, profile we're going to choose? What resolution are we going to set it at? So first, you've heard me say before that we can print to a JPEG file or send to the printer. That's set right here. So right here you can say print to the printer or to a JPEG file. And if you set it to a JPEG file, that basically exports a JPEG file with, with that layout exactly the way it looks. If you set it to printer, then you have a checkbox here for draft mode printing. This basically allows you to print a low resolution copy of your image to save time. I've never ever used that in five years of using Lightroom. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a, some people that use it to spit out quick contact sheets, but I just, just as well print the, uh, the main image with full resolution. Now this checkbox here is very critical, the print resolution. If this is unchecked, as I mentioned before, it means that Lightroom is going to use the native resolution of the file and not do any resampling, upsampling, et cetera. So if we print this image as it is, we're going to print it at 114 PPI, which uh, those of you who were here last week for my class on printing know that that is too low of a resolution to print on 8.5 by 11. Lightroom does give you the option to up-res the image, in other words, to uh, add more resolution. And that's what you would do if I check this on. Then you can type here a specific resolution to print that. So I could say 240, I can say 300, and now it's going to print it at 300 PPI. Now this isn't, um, you know, a run-of-the-mill up-res. It's it's actually really good. I mean, it actually does a great job of up-resing, and I use it on occasion when I'm not going to really big extremes. So it works really well. If I am, if I do have to up-res a lot, or it's a critical picture, then I probably w will use something like uh, like. Uh, photo resize, which used to be called genuine fractals uh, in Photoshop. Just something that's a little bit more uh, heavy duty. But this one works pretty well and I usually, unless I'm making a, a, a large print, I'll usually try this one and see how it looks. And if it looks fine, then I save the trip of having to export a Photoshop file, use a plugin, bring it back in. I can do this all in the raw file, so. All right, so that's the print resolution setting here. Below that, we have the print sharpening, which I mentioned is incorporated from the photo kit sharpener plugin and all that means is that it's 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 good it's a good quality sharpening and it looks at the image it looks at the resolution and tries to apply the best sharpening possible based on two things one you're able to choose the media type from matte to glossy okay so whether you're printing on a matte paper or a glossy that's gonna uh, require a different type of sharpening so I'm gonna say matte and then Either matte or glossy is going to give you a, 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 a choice here of low standard and high. And again, I've tried all of these and tested myself, and I probably use the, the standard like 90% of the time. Um, a lot of this has to do, these settings here, low standard and high, will definitely be, uh, uh, be affected by how you sharpen the image in the develop module. So some people will say, well, I only use high because I, I find that if I use lower standard, it doesn't look sharp enough to me. And typically I'll say, well, what kind of sharpening are you doing in the develop module? Because that'll have a, a, an impact. So if you sharpen your images properly in the develop module, and that means not leaving it at default of 25, but actually moving it up and de determining what radius you need and that kind of thing in the develop module, then the standard seems to work pretty well here. So, I guess what I'm saying is make sure that you take the time to sharpen properly in the develop module and then this will kind of really be much more useful and, and sort of automatic because they do a good job of trying to determine what the right sharpening is for the print. 16-bit uh, output, if you're on a Mac, you want that to be turned on because again, uh, the, all of the printers now that the Epson and the Canon will print at 16 bits. If you have raw files, uh, even if they're 12 or 14, you're going to send out 16, or you're going to send out whatever bits you have and not get limited to 8. 
And then the last one here, color management, probably the most important one if you want to get accurate colors. And here you can set whether it's managed by the printer or managed by a specific profile. Okay, and if you leave it at managed by printer, that means that the printer is going to decide what colors to use and means that everything you've done in Lightroom in terms of the profile is going to be, it's not going to be used. So again, same thing here. You want to choose other because I don't have any showing. So I'm going to select other. And again, here we have our list of profiles. Okay, and I can, let's say I'm just going to check off two here. And then we can choose the profile that we want to print with. And if I choose this one here, then that's the profile. And again, we have our rendering intent, same as before. Now, if you do your soft proofing, all right, then you will use, you're going to want to use those same exact settings. So when you do your soft proofing, if you choose a specific profile and you determine that you want to use the perceptual rendering intent, then over here you're going to make sure that it's set to perceptual rendering intent. And when you do your soft proofing and you choose those things in the soft proof, when you come into the print module in Lightroom, it will automatically choose those settings for you. Okay, now the reason why I didn't choose it for me now is because I didn't really have that profile enabled in the print module. But from now on, every time you make soft proof settings, meaning you choose a rendering intent and a paper profile, that gets stored together with the virtual copy. And when you bring that virtual copy into the print module, Lightroom will automatically choose that profile for you because it's going to assume, it's assuming that that's the profile you want to use to print. So from a workflow standpoint, that makes printing, you know, just a lot easier uh, and leaves less room for making mistakes and user error and, you know, just sort of nodding off on the job, that kind of thing. So um, there is an adjustment down here called print adjustment. And this is sort of, um, I think there are different conflicting opinions on this. Basically what this does is this allows you to, to add an extra adjustment in case your prints are always dark or your prints are always bright. So after you've done all of that, you can say, well, just make the print a little bit brighter than normal because my prints always tend to be dark. And I personally don't like using that because I think that um, you should be able to get the print looking the way you want without having to resort to that. That's a very, first of all, you don't see what it does. So when I turn this on, I can adjust this any way I want. You don't actually see what it's doing. So you have to make a print and then guess that the number is correct. Uh, zero to 50 doesn't really tell me much in terms of how much that is. And the other thing is, the, one of the biggest, shall we say, uh, mistakes or things that people can improve when they're making their prints is to make sure that when you uh, um, evaluate a print, okay, when you're evaluating a print compared to what you see in your monitor, that the light that you have on the print is more or less equal to the light that's coming out of your monitor. And if your monitor is very bright, and lots of us tend to work with bright monitors or that's just the way the beautiful iMac looks because it's got a, this beautiful, great, beautiful monitor and then your print comes out of the uh, machine, the light is, may not be as bright. And if it doesn't look as bright, then guess what? Your print's gonna look dark compared to the computer screen. So the way to combat that is A, I always move my monitor away from full bright. I don't like it to be too bright. I like it to be sort of comfortable. Um, number two, make sure that you have enough light on your print when you're evaluating it so that the light level on the print, on the paper, more or less matches the luminosity that you're getting off of the monitor. And you'd be surprised how bright uh, these monitors are. Okay. One last step here. Once I have this all laid out the way you see it here, this is one of the magic things of Lightroom, in my opinion, which is now you can come over here and you can say, in the template browser here, I can click on this little plus sign and I can save everything that I've done up to now, you can save that as a template. So I'm gonna type in here, 8.5 by 11 and I want to type in the printer and the paper because everything that we set is specific to that. In other words, I set a profile and I chose my printer. So usually actually I put the, the uh, printer name first. So I'll put something like that, Epson 8.5 by 11 and then I'll say, um, well let's say brother because that's what I'm actually using here. And I'll put here um, name and the name means that I, I put my name at the bottom of the print. This is something you can just figure out your own way of naming it so that you're kind of familiar with it. I tend to put the printer first because that really defines everything. Like if I'm printing on my Epson or my Canon, that's the first thing that, that, I, that I put in the name so that I know which profile, or which template, I'm sorry, I can select. And once I hit create, you, you also have an option here of creating different folders for your templates. And I have two folders here, one called examples, one called user templates. 
but if I'm gonna put this into user templates, I'll hit create. And now you see that right in here on the left, I have this template saved. And just like everything else in Lightroom, as I scroll over these templates, you can see the little preview on the top left shows me what those templates look like. So it gives you a very visual way of um, seeing what, you know, what the template is. If you forget, you have lots of templates, et cetera. So if I go back to the library module and I scroll around and I choose, um, let's say, any image, I'm gonna just gonna pick uh, this image here, okay, and then I hit Command P again, and I come back into the print module, I'm ready to go. Like, aside from, let's say, the having to change the cell size, because maybe the image has a different aspect ratio, that kind of thing, I'm ready to go. If the image fits, and I'm happy with the way this looks, I'm ready to go. And the other thing is, if I select multiple images here, like this, so I've got one, two, well, let's, let's deselect that one, because this is a panoramic. Let's select this one here. If I got those four images selected, then, um, oops, that's the wrong one. I wanna choose all um, horizontal images. If I have those four selected, then I can hit print, and Lightroom will print all four images for me without me having to go through the dialogues repeatedly. You can't do that in Photoshop. In Photoshop, you have to print, you can print one image many times, but if you wanna print different images, you have to go through those dialogues every single time. So if I wanted to spit out 10 images, 10 different images using this template, this is a simple way to do it. And once I have that template set up, then the next time I do it, it's, it's really, really easy and simple. And I just gotta make sure that the paper feeds into the printer. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much it. All right. Now let me show you a few other examples of templates and layout so that you can get a better idea of like what you can do and it kind of gives you, gets you thinking. So I mentioned before being able to um, export as a JPEG file. So for instance, here is a, another template, okay, with, I call it a gray mat. And what I've done here is, I'm gonna turn off the guides. So this is a template that has a paper size without the borders, so that I can have gray all the way to the edge. I'm using a page background, okay? And then I've also used a border on the image to give it the appearance of a mat, right? And then I've added the title, which is part of the metadata, like I showed you before, and then I put my name on the bottom. So this I can export as a JPEG file, and I can come over here. When I change here the print job to JPEG file, I get different, a different set of uh, options here. So when I switch to JPEG file, I can say, I can choose the print resolution, all right? Uh, if I'm gonna go to, uh, to the web, then I'll type in here 72, because I don't need 300 DPI. If I'm just gonna go on the internet, I don't need all that resolution because it's not, I don't, I'm not gonna need a huge file. I can set the print sharpening again. I can say low, medium, and high. Media type standard or glossy. Don't know what that is because we're doing it, we're printing to a JPEG. So um, I usually just leave it at, at matte, I guess. I haven't really noticed which is better or worse. But again, we're sending a JPEG. Um, you can change the JPEG quality, okay? And then if you wanted, you can also output a specific file dimension if you need it to output an actual specific size, okay? So this allows you to, let's, let's just do this real quick. Um, I'm gonna set this to sRGB as a color profile because we're, I'm gonna put this on the internet. If I say print to file, it asks me, asks me where to put it. So I'm gonna say, uh, let's put it on my desktop and we'll call it uh, matte sample. progress bar up here, it's done. And if I switch to my desktop here, notice that I had four images selected when I did this. Okay, not one. So because I had four, it, it output all four images with that matte template. So that was really fast and easy, okay? All right, so that's really nice if you, you, know, you want to do this kind of thing. The other feature that's really nice about this is that you can print from this. Let's say you want to use a, a lab, a color lab. You know, someone else is going to print for you. You want to send it off to one of these labs. You can export this exactly the way you want it and then send them a JPEG file and they can print from that. I would make sure that you set the quality to 100 so you get the, the highest quality JPEG file. But again, this makes it really easy to generate a nice custom template. Uh, here's another one called vertical, right? And that's for something like this. And again, notice that in the name, I just 
gave it the same name, but I called one H and one V. So again, I'm just using a vertical template versus, versus a horizontal. Uh, here's, um, let's see here. Um, now let me, let me, before I get to some of the others here, let's talk about the picture package and custom package, because these are pretty important here. So let's go back to my basic and a half by 11. In addition to one picture, you can put multiple pictures. Now, if I wanted to print this twice, with the same image, right here in the layout, I'm still in single image. In the layout, I can say, give me two columns and two rows, okay? And in order for you to get all four images, you have to make sure up here, you click on repeat one image per page. So click on that and you get all four. I'm gonna turn the guides on. And then now you have four cells that you can space and you can size any way you want. You can adjust your margins left and right. Okay, and this allows you to print four images on one page, uh, the same image. If you wanted to print different images, you can just select, uh, you'd have to go into the, into, another, into the custom package for that. But at least here we can choose you can choose four images, and if I shrink this down to one, two like that, you can do something like this. You can have all kinds of varieties of printing multiple images on one page, okay? Uh, sometimes it's useful to put multiple images, different images on one page, and for that you would use the custom package up here. Now the picture package, basically allows you to print up uh, what, what pre-built packages of different sizes because in the, in the regular single image package, the images will have to be the same size. If you want to print them at different sizes, then you go into the picture package here, and then you can choose different sizes. Now, this is a template that's already made, but let's say we start from scratch. So I'm gonna select each one of these cells and delete the images. So the way you would do this is I'm gonna pick, uh, let's say, this image here, and then once we're in this picture package, right here in cells, we have these pre-built sizes. And I can say, give me one five by seven. Uh, give me a two, two, uh, a two by five, another two by five. And if you go to a, a, a size that's bigger than fits on that page, then it will generate another page for you, okay? If I don't want that to happen, then I'm gonna delete this one here. I'm gonna go back to this one, and I'm gonna make another smaller one, like a four by six, no, it's too big. Now, if it stays too big, you can always go and, and shrink this down by hand. And I can move this back over the other one over here, okay? And so this allows you to make you know, multiple images. You can set uh, the photo border, but you also have another option here called inner stroke. So the photo border is on the outside of the image, the inner stroke is on the inside. So you can have multiple strokes and borders. The photo border, you cannot change the color. It's always gonna be white. It just basically puts a border. But the stroke is an actual color like we showed before, an actual color uh, border. All right, so let me turn the guides off so you see what that looks like a little better. Uh, photo guides here. Okay, that's what that's gonna look like. And again, all of these can be saved uh, as templates. If I go into custom package, okay, then the custom package allows me to do multiple images at multiple sizes. Okay, and I like to do this basically uh, manually sometimes. So you can, in addition to creating the, adding to the, to the page the sizes, you can also drag images right from the film strip. So for instance, let's say I know I wanna print a bunch of images, I'll drag this one and I can just drag it right up here like that. And right up here, I can set the size that I want. Okay, now a nice handy feature is if you want to make the cell size the same size as the picture, all right, you can control or right click on the image and say match photo aspect ratio, and then it'll match the size of the cell to the picture itself. So this is nice, for instance, let's say I drag another one up here, I'm gonna drag this panorama, and I get kind of lost where I've done this thing, I'm not really sure the actual size that I want, or I should say the aspect ratio, I don't know if it's correct, I can right click or control click on it and say, match photo aspect ratio, and then I get, I get it to the right, um, showing the entire image. And so I could do this, I can lay uh, images out here very visually and very, you know, just by eye. And I've built a couple of uh, templates here. So one of them is like a, a collage. 
So this could be a collage. And basically what I've done here is these are just cells that I'm dragging on. So as I mentioned before, in addition to dragging the pictures, I can also just add a cell. So I can do this and drag this cell where I want it. If I'm not really sure what the, pic the picture that's going to be there, I can keep dragging cells on here. And when I'm done, I can have something like this. right? And notice that also the cells are overlapping. And the cells are not only overlapping, but some cells are in front of others. So for instance, once I have this laid out the way I want, I can come in here to um, a bunch of images, and I can just drag these on here like this. Okay, and if I don't like the way that one looks, um, I can drag another one over here, over here, um, over here. What haven't I used yet? Let's see here. No, no let's take. Uh, you get the idea. So, okay, I can do. So I can do something like that. Can you have one be in front? Yes, yes. So if I wanted to make this one in front, again, right click and uh, send forward. And send forward again. Send to front. OK? All right. So you can do this kind of thing where you can actually make a collage. It could be with landscapes. It could be with people. It could be whatever you want. I can add an identity plate All right, down here. I'm going to make this larger. All right, and you can wind up with something like that, which, and then you can save that as I saved it before, and you can reuse this over and over again or make different ones. You can print it to an actual piece of paper, or you can save it as a JPEG. Now, another nice thing you can do with this is save it as a PDF. And as far as I know, I think that's only something that's built into the Mac operating system. So if I wanted to save this as a PDF, I would choose in my print job here, I would choose JPEG file, OK? And then I would say, of course, let's say I'm going to set these properly. So I'm going to say uh, print sharpening standard. Uh, file resolution, I'll, I'll leave it at 300. And I'll say print to file. And then in the Macintosh dialog, um, actually, no, I'm sorry. I, time out. I made a mistake. So the print to file would be to print as a JPEG. If I wanted to export a PDF, I need to use the print dialog. So uh, use as the printer here, when I do print, right there, I can say PDF. And every print dialog on the Mac has this little PDF option. And I can say PDF, save PDF, save as PDF. Now it gives me a dialog. I'll put this on my desktop. Okay, and when I go back to my uh, desktop here, there's my PDF okay, that I can share. So the, the PDF function in, on the Mac is a part of the printing. So you have to actually go to the print dialog, and then you can set to PDF. That was my, uh, my confusion there. Here's an example of a contact sheet. Okay, and I'm going to go back to uh, my I'm uh, just choosing here a contact sheet, and I'm going to turn the photo guides on so you can see, right? And if I choose here now a bunch of images, and I'm going to set the page to be, that's what I wanted, okay. OK, so that's an example of a, of a contact sheet, for instance. All right? And if I want to lay this out a little bit better, okay, basically what I've done is I've made a page with five rows and five columns. Okay, I've set, I'm going to change my margins here, left and right, top and bottom. I'm going to turn the guides off for a minute. Okay, so that's my contact sheet. If I want to leave a little space on the bottom, again, we can add a little bit of a, a border on the bottom, raise our, our bottom margin. And then I can add my identity plate again. And with a contact sheet, especially, it's useful, I think, to show uh, the photo information. So I'm going to turn on the photo information um, here. Okay, and that gives the names or the titles to the to the to the to the images. 
And I, let's make a little smaller font here so it's kind of small like that. All right, and that would be a simple contact sheet that you can save that as a template as well. And this is good if you've got lots of pictures to show a client or something and they want, you want to have them choose from one or the other or whatever. Just give me a second. Um, one more thing I want to show you, which is kind of an advanced uh, feature, is making a triptych. And then we'll take whatever questions you have. One of the things I learned online from a blog somewhere, I don't remember, this is not my, uh, I didn't come up with this idea, but I, I, I found out about it, is if you want to make a triptych, meaning you want to take one image and then you want to divide it up into three and then have different parts of the image shown, the way to do that is as follows. You have to find, you have to, I'm going to take one image here. Okay, so here's my original image. And then I'm going to make two virtual copies of it. Identical virtual copies. I'm not doing any changes to the other two. Okay, so I have three. Then I go into the print module. And I'm going to choose here, uh, I have this template already saved, but I'll show you how I made it. Okay, I'm going to turn the photo guides on. And so you notice here what I have is I have three cells, okay? And the three cells are divided equally so that the three cells will be the same width of my full image, right? And I've set um, you know, some space between them, all right? And then the key is here that you notice I only have one image selected here in the bottom. And I do not have the repeat one photo per page turned on. If I turn this on, that's what happens. So it takes the same image, in other words, that one original file that I have down here in the bottom left, and it repeats it three times. But you notice that it's showing me the same thing in all three of the cells. And if I move this around, it moves them all around equally. That's not what I want. What I want is I want to have three ind independent images that I can scroll around. The way to do that is you turn the repeat one uh, photo per page off, and then you select your two virtual copies, which in essence are independent of the original, right? Now I can take this one and put it way off to the left like this. And then I can take this one and move it so that I'm basically going to look at the image and bring this off like that. And then over here, I'm going to take the same thing and I'm going to move this so that the part that's repeating is outside of the cell. And there I basically have a triptych. OK, so the key to this is to whatever image you want to use, and if it's a diptych, then you would use two, right? You would make a virtual copy once. If it's a triptych, you would make three. And then do not use the um, repeat one photo per page. So that this way you can put three individual images in, and then you can independently adjust them the way you want. And so this is a kind of a nice uh, way to, to do this. And if I turn the show guides off, that's, that's the finished, kind of the finished piece. And again, I can print this. It would print really nice, or I could, um, Export it. You can also experiment with things like borders. If I wanted to add a border to this, okay, I can do that. There's all many, many different ways that you can do this. But again, the greatest thing about this is that I can now save this as a template. This is going to be an eight and a half by eleven triptych for horizontal image. If I did a vertical one, um, it would be you know it would be a vertical image, and I would divide it up the same way with the same spacing. But I would just make it vertical. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. I hope that was useful. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.